All right, uh, let's pray together and then we will jump into the fifth commandment. So let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have given us uh, another day that we can uh, consider your word, consider your law. Uh, Father, we praise you that we are not going, we are not justified by our ability to keep your law, for we would all fail, but that we are justified because Christ was able to keep your law, uh, kept it perfectly, and that his righteousness is imputed to us. Uh, Lord, I pray that this will uh, not only sanctify us, but cause us to love Christ more. We pray all these things in his name. Amen. All right. So, the fifth commandment, uh, the fifth commandment tells us to honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord has given you, Exodus 20, verse 12. Now, the uh, Westminster Larger Catechism argues that by father and mother in the fifth commandment are meant not only our natural parents, but all superiors in age and gifts, and especially such as by God's ordinance are over us in a place of authority, whether in family, church, or commonwealth. So they're saying this extends beyond just familial uh, authority structures to all authority structures. Uh, and we will go into more of that in a minute. But do you see what they are arguing? Uh, this requires us to handle all our authority relationships properly. This goes beyond simply telling children to listen to their parents. This is commanding, or this commandment is telling us to honor all authority figures that God has put in place, therefore defending the very fabric of society itself. Uh, now, we will explore this conclusion and how they got there in a few minutes, but I think we should take a few minutes to just note the implications of this idea. If the fifth commandment is really about our relationship with authority, then the Bible is holding the family up as the most important uh, authority relationship we have. The family is the building block of society and should not be replaced by anything else. We build a good and stable society by having men leave their fathers and mothers and unite with a wife and raise a godly family. This is a direct contradiction to many ideas we'll see today, such as having an all-powerful state dictate everything, or uh, more radical, autonomous, I do whatever I want and I'm not connected to anyone else ideas. God places us into families and fastens us to other people with familial bonds that cannot be broken at will. Therefore, an attack on the family is an attack on society itself. It destroys the very glue that holds society together. If the family falls, then society will fall with it. Now, I think this makes sense if we just stop and think about it, that the family is the key to society itself after all, where do children first learn how to interact with other people in society? Where do they learn what boundaries are, what can be pushed, and what cannot? Who sets the expectations for how children should work? Ideas about honesty, timeliness, and so many other concepts that affect us every day. What is the primary institution that shapes and forms the child into that adult person that we meet with every day? Is that not the family? Is it not their parents who are primarily shaping them? Parents are the ones who set the standards and expectations for their children. Perhaps more importantly, they're the ones who set the example for their children to follow, whether that be a good or a bad example. Now, I'm not saying that they're the only factor uh, for how, how a child, child will turn out, but they are the most important factor. And the family is the institution that God has ordained to raise up children and, by extension, to build society. Therefore, 
If you are troubled about the state of society around you, then the most important thing, the most important thing that we can do is to build godly families, which is not to say that there aren't other things we can do, but building godly families should take priority. I suspect we all have to face uh, the temptation to think that the greatest contribution that we can give to society is found in our work, whether that be in church or culture or politics or something else. While these things are all important and should be taken seriously, we must remember uh, that they should not be pursued at the expense of our families. How many politicians have we seen who have poured themselves into making the state better at the expense of their children? Or how many pastors have we seen who have poured themselves into the ministry and neglected their wives and marriages? How many parents have sacrificed so much to improve their careers and financial stability at the expense of their children? We could probably go on and on with examples, but I think if we think about it, we can see all around people sacrificing their families for something that is good and should be pursued, and yet they have completely messed things up. Cotton Mather used to ask his congregation, and I couldn't find the book this week, the problem with having books everywhere, uh, but he would say, do you think your children are going to thank you if you've given them all these material blessings and yet on Judgment Day, you neglected to give them the gospel. Just an idea of, we need to put this in perspective. Uh, our families need to take priority, and I think the fifth commandment, by placing this as the uh, primary authority relationship that it mentions, is clearly stating that. Any questions or comments at this point about the, just this idea that the family is what God has instituted as the primary building block of society. Okay, let's ask, what are parents supposed to do for their children? Now, there are countless things, so I'm going to try and just jump from, uh, kind of do a brief outline summary, and if I miss something, uh, please bring it up at the end. But let, let's jump into this. So, in Ephesians 6, Paul makes clear that not only do children have obligations to their parents in the fifth commandment, but that parents also have obligations to their children. They are not to provoke their children, but they are to bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And so we must ask, what are the duties of parents toward their children? So first, I think parents are to instruct their children, specifically instruct their children in the ways of God. Uh, in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7, we read, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk to them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise up. Here, God charges parents with instructing their children in the ways of the Lord. And if you look at that verse again, it is not a you take them to Sunday school once a week sort of instruction, although Sunday school, I believe, is a blessing and we should take full advantage of it. But it's very much this, you should constantly be teaching them about the ways of the Lord. Look down at that verse again. You shall teach it diligently to your children. You shall talk about it when you sit in your house, when you walk in the way, when you lie down, when you rise. Almost as if you should talk to them about the things of God during dinner, when you're in the car, when you're about to go to bed, when you're getting up in the morning, when you're brushing your teeth, as often as it comes up, 
or as often as you can bring it up, you should be instructing them in the ways of the Lord. I know a lot of people my parents' age would uh, told me when they were raising their kids, they almost assumed, well, we took them to church and we thought that they would teach them the ways of the faith. And I would say that clearly, the Bible clearly tells us, no, there has to be more than that. You cannot rely on a once a week kind of theological Christian education and that that's what they need. It's clearly a constant daily form of instruction. So uh, beyond just uh, instructing them in the doctrines of the church and the ways of God, we can um, look at, actually, before I talk about the book of Proverbs, I just would like to say, can I give a special exhortation to the fathers here? There are so many times when the Bible singles out fathers particularly for the commands to raise their children in the fear of the Lord. And men, if your children see that you're not very serious about the things of God, then they will think that they are not serious. If they see that you are 10 times more excited about a sports game than you are about worshiping God, then they will think that sports are 10 times as important as God. And I think I have seen this happen many times, and it's heartbreaking. And so uh, let me just ask, let me beg, plead, uh, take seriously the charge to lead your family uh, in the ways of God. I, I feel like I can't overemphasize that. Now, I'd like to say that uh, the Bible tells us we need to instruct our children in more ways than just theological education. In fact, the book of Proverbs teaches us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. And it goes on to show us that parents are supposed to teach their children how to conduct themselves in all of life. Again, I don't think this forbids the use of schools or outside help, but it places the primary responsibility upon the parents to see that children are raised and trained up properly. You cannot simply send them off to school and assume that your task is done. You are going to be guiding and instructing them as often as you're able to do so. And I, I think uh, as we read the book of Proverbs, you can see it is very much the father and the mother who are raising the child. Are there other people helping? I think we can say, of course there are. And yet, it seems like the Bible always puts the primary emphasis, it's on the parents. Uh, another, well, any questions about that before we press on? Yes, go. this on now? Okay. Yes. So I think my question would be that, I mean, you made the point that fathers and mothers have the primary responsibility mm -hmm. to raise their children. I guess the question would be like, is it possible for them to delegate part of that responsibility to someone else? Say like, if you send your kid off to school, in a sense you're almost delegating. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think so. Yes. So I, I think, uh, I don't think there's a conflict between those two ideas. I think we see it, if, if you look closely, you, you'll see it in the Old Testament. Uh, so the Old Testament especially, it's the father's uh, raising their children, and the, yet we'll see there is some delegating going on. So, for example, when Ruth has uh, Opid, uh, we get this kind of, this one line, and Naomi became his nurse. Uh, 
And, we, and if you look around, uh, Rebecca and Rachel both had nurses, and so it seems like uh, they had, they would, had nurses that would help raise uh, the child or the children, and so it seems like they must be doing some delegating, and yet that seems consistent with the idea that uh, parents are the primary respons primarily responsible. Another example I can think of is with Abraham. He basically delegates to his servant, find a wife for Isaac. Now, I suspect that if his servant came back and had brought someone who was, uh, had been like, you know what? I thought it was too, too long of a journey to go all the way back to your relatives. I just found some local pagan. Uh, Abraham would have said, would have said uh, no, that's not gonna fly. Um, so he, it seems like he delegated a very important responsibility to his servant, and yet I, I think he was still calling the shots. So I would say, uh, so I, I teach at a school, and the parents are delegating authority to me, and yet there are clear things that I can do and that I can't do. I, I know there are often times when uh, children will be getting a little bit squirrely, and I will say to someone else at the school, well, if this was my, or there's one person at my school who will often say, well, if it was my child, I'd know exactly what to do. But, you know, we have limitations. And so generally we just, if they get too out of hand, we'll just send a message back to their parents and say, hey, this happened, uh, could you please take care of this? And I, I work at a school where parents are very supportive and they take these things very seriously, so they generally take care of it. Um, so I think delegating authority is, the authority is always limited, and in, but to answer your question, yes, I think you can delegate and still maintain primary responsibility to the parents. Any, uh, Bob? Yes. Yes, I would say that I, I should have mentioned that. I'd say when you delegate, you want to be very careful to keep a close eye on what's being taught to your children or what they're letting your children do. Uh, I, I would even, uh, so for example, I. Like with academic institutions that I've attended, I still try and keep a close eye on them because if I'm going to recommend a school to one of my kids or their families, the, I, I want to make sure that they're teaching them things that are orthodox, they have not gone off the deep end, and I think the idea of just handing them off to an institution and assuming they'll be okay is, not, is unwise to say the least. You should keep a very close eye on what they're up to. Okay, uh, the next thing that I, I think parents should do for their children is to set a godly example. Uh, it is assumed that parents are going to set a good example for their children in Exodus 12, 26, when we are told, and when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so what's going on here is they're observing the Passover and God says, your children are gonna ask you, why is it that we're doing this? And it's just assumed. We do these things and the kids will be like, what's going on here? And the parents are supposed to take that as an opportunity to explain uh, why they do what they do. Uh, later, we'll see that in the New Testament, Paul compares himself to a father 
for the Corinthians, and he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Also with Timothy, he tells him, set an example to the church because Timothy was acting like their spiritual father. And so uh, setting a godly example is a very important thing that parents are to do. I, I will say personally, I have been surprised by how many things I learned from my parents and did not realize it until somebody, I ran into someone who did something differently. Uh, so, for example, uh, my parents were always very careful with money, and so I was just naturally and very, very careful with my money, and then I went to college and discovered that some people had spending habits that, quite honestly, I found shocking. And I just realized it's something I picked up from my parents and didn't realize. And there have been countless things like that, that I didn't realize that I had learned them until I met someone who didn't. Uh, many things as pertains to the faith. I saw my mother reading her Bible every single morning for my entire life uh, and things of that nature. I didn't realize what had happened to me until years and years later and then I discovered, oh my, I learned so many things from my parents just by watching what they did. And we can't underestimate that. Next, I think uh, parents need to uh, discipline their children. Now, the French thinker Jean-Jacques Rousseau, pardon my French, uh, wrote a, a truly despicable book uh, called Emile, in which he describes how he will skillfully develop an imaginary child, imaginary being an important word, named Emile, not by discipline and careful instruction, but rather by drawing out the talents and innate goodness already implanted in the young child. He was going to do away with traditional methods of drill and discipline, and instead simply guide the child into all learning by carefully directing his natural curiosity. I think that Rousseau and the countless thinkers that have come in his tradition have a very faulty understanding and blatantly unbiblical understanding of human nature and that they deny uh, the sin nature that is within every child. Instead, they argue that the solution to our problems is due to a child's lack of understanding, the need for more creative teaching strategies or perhaps even medication these days. While sometimes these things are true and they are helpful and necessary, I think that oftentimes they simply are covering up that fact that they deny the idea that folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Proverbs 22:15. While we may have other options than simply a rod, uh, it would be naive for us to think that discipline has become outdated or that children should not have a healthy fear of disobeying their parents. God has called us to be parents and not their buddies. A very important distinction. Any questions uh, about that? Next, I think we should talk about protecting our children. When it comes to protecting our children, I think it can be easy to be either overprotective or underprotective. On the one hand, we can fall into the temptation of being so uh, protective over our children that we try to prevent them from even scraping their knees. On the other hand, we can be so eager to get them off our hands for a few hours that we are willing to hand them over to basically anyone who will take them for a few hours, not worrying about what those people may say to them, do to them, or more likely let them do to themselves, which can be very surprising. Uh, furthermore, as children grow, we ought to protect them less and less that they will be, so that they will be able to eventually become fully functioning adults on their own and leave their parents and be independent 
And I would say, given uh, all of these factors, it's very hard to say how protective we should be at any one time, but we can say that we should take the idea of protecting our children very seriously, uh, not just physically, but from harmful ideas, and we should constantly be reevaluating uh, should are we getting it right? Because it's going to constantly be changing. Next, uh, we, I want to give a quick word about providing for our children. Uh, in a world where healthcare, the internet, and a job that we like are often considered human rights, we really do need to stop and ask ourselves, what does God actually expect us to provide for our children? Now, Paul is quite clear that if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever, 1 Timothy 5, 8. However, the question still remains, what does it mean to provide? Does Paul mean that if we do not take our kids to Disneyland, give them a car when they are 16, and pay for their college, we are worse than an unbeliever. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that Paul gives us a helpful definition when he says in the next chapter, if we have food and clothing with these, we should be content. Why? Because godliness with contentment is of great gain. Now, I will say that I personally am a beneficiary of parents and even grandparents who made great uh, financial sacrifices so I could attend rather expensive schools. My family has blessed me with countless material blessings, and I am all in favor of families blessing their children, if that is possible. However, the point I want to make abundantly clear here is that beyond the basic necessities of life, what your children really need are godly parents, not more junk. I think that we need to shed the idea that we owe our children piles of presents under the tree every Christmas, a phone when they're in high school, and outrageously expensive college degrees that most of them won't use anyways. Again, I'm not denying or saying that these things are wrong. I am simply saying that we should ask ourselves what is actually necessary and push back against the idea that all these things have to be done if we are actually providing for our children. We need to focus on giving to our children what God expects us to give them, not what the world tells us to give them. After all, what advantage is it if they gain the whole world and yet lose their soul? And I will say that I was dumbfounded when I went to visit one of my friends and I met his family and his father had 15 children told me he had never made more than $40,000 a year and had never been in debt. And that turned my entire world upside down. Uh, there were a lot of things he was not able to give his children, and yet he gave them a godly home, and they were all being productive members of society. And I have to say, he, I think he provided better for his children than a lot of people who had a lot more. Again. I am very thankful for the blessings my family gave to me, and yet I think we need to ask ourselves what is necessary and what is just a blessing that we can add. Any questions or comments about that? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think, I think we can say that. Uh, can parents... Okay, we've sort of already talked about delegating authority, so I'm going to skip this section because I think uh, that would be redundant at this point. So let's uh, flip the coin, so to speak, and talk about uh, duties owed to parents. Uh, before we do that, is there 
anything, any questions or comments, anything that I have missed that someone, yes, go. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, I think that is an excellent point. Uh, there, so I, I guess, let me, ref, let me refine my comment. I'd say we can delegate to some extent, but you're right. If your idea is, as was once common among the arist aristocracy, send the kids off to boarding school, they'll figure it out. Uh, I think that's very problematic because uh, as we have seen earlier, uh, there are other things, you know, parents are to teach their children. They are to set an example. And so I agree there is some limit on how much we can delegate. I'm not exactly sure how to draw that line, where to draw that line. But I think we would probably all agree that line is somewhere. Yes, James. Oh, Justin. <laughs> Yes. 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 Yeah, so I think perhaps what I want to say, let me see, is uh, there is, even with delegation, that's not, delegating is different than completely disconnecting. Uh, maybe that's the way to say it. But, uh, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay, let's talk briefly about duties owed to parents. How do we honor our parents? I think that the Westminster Larger Catechism gives us an excellent definition when it says we should show our parents and other authorities all due reverence in heart word and behavior, so we need to respect them with what we do think and say. Prayer and thanksgiving for them, that was particularly convicting. I noticed I, I have not uh, thanked God for the parents he gave me often enough. Uh, imitation of their virtues and graces, and I think that's a very perceptive comment because they are distinguishing or realizing that parents are not perfect, we need to distinguish between their virtues and graces and not simply copy them outright. Willing obedience to their lawful commands and counsels, due, due submission to their corrections, fidelity to defense and maintenance of their persons and authority according to their several ranks and the nature of their places, bearing with their infirmities Realizing your parents are not perfect and uh, giving, showing them grace and covering them with love that so they may be an honor to them and to their government. Now, in his book, Written in Stone, uh, Philip Ryken helpfully points out that this will look different depending on what stage of life we are in. We tell small children simply to obey their parents, but as they get older, uh, we qualify and the relationship does change. We start, as they become more independent, we tell them honoring their parents may look a bit different. I find uh, with my middle schoolers that I teach, there's more that I have to say than simply obey their parents, which includes things like don't complain about what your parents will and will not let you do to your little buddies. Uh, also, defend the name and honor of your parents. Don't throw them under the bus. 
uh, things of that sort. Uh, even when we are adults, I think we should be careful to defend uh, the name and honor of our parents, uh, jealously guard their reputation, while admitting they do have faults, and we should also still seek their advice. I think the question will quickly arise, what happens when our parents are not Christians or they happen to be pushing something that is just not godly? Uh, I think we can still say that we need to be respectful when we discuss these things with them. Furthermore, just because they are not Christians does not necessarily mean that they are wrong. I know that there are many people who decide to go to seminary against the wishes of their parents. I bring this up because... I myself went to seminary, uh, and there were many people there who I thought, you know, you probably shouldn't be here. Uh, this was probably not the wisest thing, and I don't know if their parents had that discussion with them. Uh, usually a combination of this isn't really your gifting and it's financially unwise, uh, but I hope their parents did. Uh, and I think oftentimes things like this, uh, it does not take a Christian to observe what you're doing here is outrageously stupid. Uh, so even when your parents are not Christians, I think we should take their advice very seriously because oftentimes they are going to be one of the few people who will say, no, what you're doing, who will tell it to you how it is. Your friends will often be worried they'll lose your friendship, soft pedal it. I mean, some parents may do that as well. But your parents, I think, are people you should always go to for advice, generally speaking. There are some situations that are very bad. Uh, however, I think we must affirm that we have to serve God rather than man. And uh, if we love our parents more than God, then we are not worthy of Christ. And so there is a balance there. We don't give them a blank check, but I think we should still take their advice very, very seriously. Any questions uh, about children's obligations to parents? Yes, go. I, I would say, I think I would say they should be taken seriously, but when you are out of, when you are your own family, uh, you're making your own decisions. Uh, so I think I would say something similar. Yes? I would, I think there may be times when for the, their health you have to step in. But for example, my grandparents are 98 and 99. They're still living in their house and <laughs> uh, nobody but my dad has ever been brave enough to suggest that maybe they should move to assisted living and my dad has really gotten it. Uh, I think for something like that, I mean, I don't think there was a problem with my dad suggesting that. That was not a dumb thing to suggest. They should think about it. But I, I would say there is some level where if they basically run the calculations and say, I would rather die a year or two earlier, but die in my own house, as opposed to go and live a little bit longer in assisted living, I think that's a rational decision. Uh, and so, uh, we shouldn't, even then, I mean, there are, it, it gets gray, but still with the utmost respect and uh, carefully, I guess, is how I'd say it. 
there is a line somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where to draw it. Uh, okay, let's talk about from parents to all authority figures. So how can we say that the fifth commandment requires us to honor all authority figures? Uh, the reason we can say this is because we have seen that all Ten Commandments are dealing with categories of issues, not just individual rules. Secondly, uh, we should note that Moses was given the Ten Commandments in a society that was a tribal system, and the head of the civil society where you were was almost certainly one of your older relatives. Uh, therefore, there was not nearly the, the distinction between civil rulers and familial uh, relations. Also, the Bible often refers to the king and other powerful figures, such as Job, as a father to their people or a father to the oppressed. And finally, we can point out that in Romans 13, Paul gives us a uh, command concerning submission to authorities, and then in verse 9, he goes on and lists the next five commandments, suggesting that he is simply exegeting the fifth commandment at the beginning of Romans 13. And I think briefly I'd say this points to the fact, idea that the fifth commandment is not just dealing with the family, but with all authority structures and relationships. Therefore, I think we can say that many of the same things about our bosses and other authority figures that we interact with as we said about parents. Now, in his book on the Ten Commandments, Thomas Watson, I think, gives us a helpful kind of short list of how we can honor our masters or bosses. Uh, he says we can do that by, one, obeying all their lawful and honorable commands, two, being diligent and working hard, uh, realizing that being slothful is stealing their time and so stealing their money, uh, three, being trustworthy and faithful, not blabbing company secrets and other things like that. And four, working for them out of a sincere love for them and their well-being. So actually uh, desiring to work well for them and not just showing up for your paycheck. Uh, it should be the case that Christians are the most desirable employees because they are always hardworking and trustworthy. Sadly, I fear that is oftentimes not the case. Uh, this commandment also has implications for those of us who have people working under us. Again, I think Watson gives us a helpful list just to kind of hit bullet points. He says that one, we should take care to provide for our servants. Two, encourage as well as correct their ser or our servants or our employees, tell them good things that they do, not just the bad things they do. Uh, be careful not to overburden them. Four, uh, seek the spiritual good of our servants. Five, be gentle with them. Six, be very exact and punctual in agreements, especially giving them their paychecks. Uh, I take that, I always took that very personally. Uh, seven, be careful of your servants when they are sick. We are not allowed to view our employees as simply a cog in the machine, which we rent out for a certain amount of time and then toss away when we are done. Uh, they are valuable humans, and we ought to treat them as such. I will just throw out there that I feel like this is one of the tragedies of over-regulating everything in that there are, when I had employees under me, there were very specific rules, specifically union rules. And so uh, oftentimes we could not be nice to employees even if we wanted to, because that would break union contracts or government regulations. And so the ability to care for our employees was somewhat limited, even if uh, the company itself had the desire uh, I know my brother worked for a company where one of his workmen, I think, had something massive fall on his leg and basically disabled him for life, and the amount of help he could give the man was limited because of union rules. Uh, the union said 
there's this much you can do. Uh, but I'm just going to make that slight jab and move on. Any questions about, or comments about this? Okay, let's uh, wrap up with a, a brief discussion about defiance of authority. Are there times when we should defy authority? I think we have to say yes. There are numerous examples of when God's people defied the decrees of temporal powers. And I guess if we look at the Gospels, even uh, ecclesiastical authorities, we are told that the Hebrew midwives refused to follow Pharaoh's commands to kill the Israelite babies because they feared God, Exodus 1.17. Uh, very importantly, Saul's own bodyguard refused to strike the priests of the Lord uh, at his direct command. They basically stood there and would not move because they knew these are the priests of the Lord. We should not be killing them. Uh, and Daniel uh, blatantly defies the king's order uh, not to pray to anyone besides the king for 30 days. Uh, Daniel, does, he's not discreet about it. He doesn't close his window. He does the same thing uh, time and again, probably knowing that that decree was aimed straight at him. Uh, he just goes right at it. With these examples in hand, I think that it is safe to conclude that there are certainly times when even the highest civil authorities give us commands which we are required to defy and at times openly defy. I think everyone would agree we must defy these authorities if they tell us that we, to do something that contradicts uh, what God has said. However, I think we need to push the question a step further. Uh, what happens when an authority figure gives us a command that is not necessarily wrong, but also not really in their sphere of authority, not really their business? So I can think of examples like uh, can the church mandate uh, bedtime for your kids? That's not really their business, and yet what happens? Are we obligated to follow them if they try to decide something like that? Or uh, can the health department forbid a church from practicing communion with a single cup? Uh, th questions like this, are we obliged to... Uh, to comply with these commands? And I think uh, the answer to these questions is no. God has given different uh, spheres of authority to different offices, and we are not allowed to usurp uh, another person's role. We, the church cannot usurp the parent's role. Uh, the state cannot usurp the church's authority, and the church cannot usurp the state's authority. All of these things have been tried on numerous occasions, and I think uh, that we are to push back uh, if someone tries to usurp uh, our sphere of authority. I think one example, although this is not the, a perfect example, but when in 2 Chronicles 26, verse 18, we see King Uzziah attempts to come into the temple with a censer basically taking over the role of a priest. He wanted to be a priest king, just like every other king. And you see the priests running in after him, and they say, it is not for you, uh, it was not for you to burn uh, incense before the Lord, but to the sons of Aaron, pushing the idea that this role was given to the priests. The king has no right to basically take that over Uzziah, you're out of line. You need to back down. And in Chronicles, it specifically says, uh, hang on, do I have it? Uh, that the 80 valiant men of the priest go in there and tell Uzziah to back down, uh, probably fully realizing that that could cost them their life, just like Saul killed all the priests of the Lord, well, all the ones there, uh, so they could also die, and yet they're pushing back. And 
So I would say that us the act of usurping the authority is itself a violation of uh, the laws of God, and so we are not obligated to comply. Uh, now, there is going to be a c complications. What happens when uh, one sphere has failed uh, to such an extent? So, for example, when parents are clearly being abusive, uh, I am, I mean, I, I would agree there is a line that others have to step in, and yet I'm very, very cautious. Uh, I think if the parents are going to uh, kind of push their kids off a cliff, uh, things have broken down. It, it's not a good idea to think, oh, well, if the state would just step in, they're going to do a better job. Not, not likely. Uh, and so I'm very, very cautious about things like that. Um, and yet I think I'm not willing to say, no, there's no room for that. Uh, any questions or comments? We have a few minutes. Uh, I would say that was completely out of line. Uh, it was, they were trying to regulate uh, the churches, and yeah, I think that was a clear overstep. Lolo. Yes, I, I think so. Uh, so the most, I guess the easiest example would be if they tell you to do something wrong, but then also when you're an adult, uh, we've probably all seen people who are adults and their parents are still trying to run their lives for them. I think it's appropriate to push back uh, and say, you know, we, t we still take our parents' advice seriously and yet, uh, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. Uh, he is not still, uh, they should not still be running uh, his life. Any other questions or comments? Follow up. Okay, well, oh, Steve. Uh, so, for the recording, Steve asked the question, uh, he gave the example of the public schools. Uh, we can all imagine we get to a point where they are so bad that we feel like we need to take, everyone should probably, should take their kids out. How do we know when we've crossed that line? Is that 
Um, yeah, I think there is a point. I would say you're going to have this spectrum. So the elders will, let's say in this example, the elders come to this point where they say, okay, I think we've crossed the line. I would say they should start encouraging, uh, speaking to it, uh, and as things deteriorate, but things will probably continue to get worse, and there's going to be a point where you'd say, okay, so there's a point where you start to speak about it, and then as things develop, if they get worse, you're going to get to a point where it's, no, this is clearly, this is no longer something that can be disputed. Uh, so I'd say there's kind of a spectrum approach, if that makes sense. You start by speaking about it and slowly dial things up as the situation gets worse. There's, go ahead, Bob. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. I, I think, too, as well, it's a good comment, Bob. Um, to Steve's specific example, uh, we, we would have to be very, very, very careful to start drawing lines of sin where scripture doesn't. Uh, that's exactly what the Pharisees did. They said, uh, we're gonna, by good and necessary consequence to cause people not to disobey the law of God, we're gonna draw the sin line over here. And, and, and for example, in, in Steve's specific scenario, we'd have to ask a ton of questions for the parents. So it could be sin, it could be sinful for a parent to leave their kid in a public school and just say, okay, the public school is going to teach my kid everything, and that's where they're going to get all their knowledge. I would argue that would be sinful, but not because the parent left their kid in public school, but because the parent has neglected their duty to actually teach their kids. Mm -hmm. So if the parent is leaving their kid in public school in saying, I want my kid to understand the philosophies of the world, but I will then teach them the things of God and how to how to combat those philosophies, then I would argue that that, that might, might be a good thing. So again, because scripture doesn't draw the line, we, we need to be very careful at drawing a line because uh, there could be a goodness in going, going beyond where we draw the line insofar as the parents still might be obeying scripture and doing a good, doing the parental duty of teaching their kid, kids. So that's, w we'd want to be very hesitant. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree. Okay, we are out of time, so let me pray, and then we will dismiss. Father, we thank you again uh, for your word. Uh, we thank you also for uh, the gift you've given us uh, of the family. Uh, Lord, we pray that we'll not uh, take it for granted, but cherish it, uh, build it carefully, protect it, love it, and honor you by it, we ask. In Jesus' name.